Hello, Pastor Doug, back again with another video. We're going to do another quiz today because, again, as you know, I love quizzes. And we're going to figure out how Calvinist are we. So this is a quiz. I don't think it's too long, but we're going to figure out if we're a hardcore Calvinist or not. As always, I like giving the warning when we take these quizzes. You actually probably learn more about the person asking the question than you necessarily do about yourself. It's good to play along and have people ask you questions. So let's give it a try. Let's give it a go. Question number one. Do you believe that humans are so depraved that they can do nothing to earn salvation and they cannot choose to believe in Jesus without the intervention of God's grace? Yes. Wait, absolutely, definitely, of course. Those are all the same answer. So this is going to be a little bit cheeky, I think. Okay, we're going to go with yes. Go with a simple one. Next. Is a person born again after they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, regeneration comes first. So let me see. Yes. No, the person must be born again regenerate before they're able to have faith. No, it happens at the same time. But regeneration logically precedes faith. It happens at the same time, but faith logically precedes regeneration. So I, I don't mind number, I guess, four here, but the Bible is very clear. You know, God makes us born again, causes us to be born again, to quote First Peter. So is a person born again after they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? The answer is no. They must be born again, regenerate before they're able to believe. Remember, before rebirth, a person is dead in sin, and dead men cannot have faith. Amen. Number three, if you had to choose one of these statements to describe God, which one would you choose? God is sovereign. Yes. God is love. Yes. God is worth of all. God is worthy of all glory. Yes. Of course, the answer should be number four. All of these. But we'll play along with the quiz and we'll take the bait and we'll focus on the sovereignty of God. By the way. There's more in the Bible about God's holiness than there is God love than there is about God's love. Now, love is the most important virtue, as Lord Jesus taught clearly in Matthew 22. But when it comes to describing God, the the Bible errs on God being holy. Let's do the next number. Let's do our next one, number four. Are you familiar with the Westminster Confession of Faith? The what? Of course, it's a good summary of the fundamental theological truths. I like that. I don't know what it is, but I know what it is. I don't know what it says, dude, I have it half memorized. I do not have it half memorized. I have nothing half memorized. I'm really bad at that. But yes, I'm aware of it. I love it dearly, actually. Did Christ die for all people without exceptions? Yes, Jesus died for the world and offers salvation to all men. No, he died for all without distinction, but not all without all exception. He died not only for Jews, but also for Gentiles. That is what the scripture is referring to and emphasizing when it says that Christ died for all. Christ died only for the elect, and I would like that answer. Christ died to provide salvation for all and to procure salvation for the elect. It is sufficient for all, but made efficacious for those who believe. He, he died only for all. <laughs> See Galatians 2.20. Um, you know, again, these are not mutually exclusive. I would tick off a lot of these, but I'm going to be a curmudgeon and go full Calvinist and go there, but other uh, that Christ died only for the elect, but other ones actually apply. Are you losing, you are losing a debate. Okay, I guess I'm doing bad at this, but I didn't realize it was a debate. What do you do? Call straw man. Claim that it is a great mystery, and who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Paraphrasing Romans 9. End the discussion with speech about Christian love and charity. A firm respect for the other party, claim that you are predestined to disagree with Calvinism, and who are they to answer back to God? Those are dumb answers. Go off and study some more Greek. Um, there's not a good answer there, so I'm going to be a little flippant and go with the Greek. Uh, they're also making fun of a lot of Calvinist Arminian debates that have happened over the last few years. Number seven, is every fact, is every act of man seek? Is every act of man secretly instigated by God? If by secret instigated you mean allowed, then yes. No, what are you talking about? That's ridiculous. Straw man. No. Yes, that's the hard truth taught in Scripture, my friend. 
You need to put aside your traditions and sentimentality here. On some level, I would argue that God ordains all things. All things are decreed by God. Yes, there is um, some depth and complexity to unpacking that, but the quick answer is yes, God is sovereign. Do the ends justify the means? Yes, no, none of the above. In relation to human affairs or in relation to God, I mean, you must know that God can do nothing wrong. What kind of like that answer? We're going to go with that one. Because, that, yeah, God is not man. One of the big mistakes Arminians tend to do is they try to make God to be very like man. And God and man are different. James White, a very famous Reformed Baptist, is a respectable scholar who knows Greek and is very good at exegesis. Yeah. Who? No, I know who James White is. Someone who is learned and whose opinion I respect. Learned, sorry. And that's a great thing to mispronounce. <laughs> Someone who is learned and whose opinion I respect. And there's a meme about that. I enjoy reading what he writes. Sincere but wrong. Um, I go with this. I, I, I enjoy I enjoy reading James White. Um, which statement mostly closely resembles your belief about free will? Truly free will exists before the fall, but since then all unsaved men have a depraved will. Mm, true. We are free beings who can choose between chocolate and vanilla for no obvious reason. We have free will because we are free to follow our desires. Uh, some truth to that. We are free agents. We determine our actions. They are not externally determined. Thus, we are morally responsible for what we do. Well, we are morally responsible for what we do, but God is sovereign. Man has free agency, of course, even though God decrees man's every action, and man can justly be held responsible for his sins. I like that one. We have free will in the sense that we always have the opinion option of acting otherwise. Again, this is not mutually exclusive, but I think this is the closest one to uh, what the scriptures teach. We have free agency, we do choose, we're held responsible for action, and God decrees all things. Number 11, God's grace can be resisted, true or false. His grace can be resisted in the life of the believer, that's true, and the grace given to the non-elect can be resisted, true, but the grace associated with regeneration and salvation is effectual. It will not fail. It does not rely on the creature. I like that. True, false, none of God's grace can be resisted. Irresistibly isn't the best way to say it, you see. God's grace regenerates a person, and then the person does not want to resist. Ugh. God could have made his grace irresistible. He doesn't. He wants a real, voluntary relationship with people. Um, this is the best answer. First one. Yeah, I mean, when it, sure, on, on some levels, we do resist grace. Sin is a, re, re, a resistance against grace. But all those whom the Father gives to the Son, he will lose not one. So, yeah, that's the best answer. Twelve, did God decree and causally determine that I make this quiz? <laughs> yes, no, yes, but you are still responsible for it. He decreed it. But he didn't causally determine it. Yes, but you're still responsible for it. I'm going to go with that. So this guy's got a sense of humor, which I appreciate. Is election unmerited and unconditional? That is to say, is God's election of a certain people not conditional on anything in that person or any foreseen qualities, works, or faith? Absolutely. To plead otherwise would be prideful. Yes, election is unconditional. Election is unmerited, but not unconditional. God picks conditions according to his good pleasure, like salvation. It is conditional on faith, which is not a work. Election is unmerited, but is unconditional. Uh, election is unconditional. So we're going to go with that. Do you believe in God's secret decrees? Yes, as opposed to his revealed will. Yes, the Bible teaches, Deuteronomy 29, 29, that there is God's revealed will, and there's God's secret will. So in other words, you know, God um, God is not the author of evil, and he tells us, you know, we should not murder, we should not steal, we should not violate his law. That is his revealed will. But when those things happen, on some level, is God behind it? You know, 100%. You know, the classic example from Scripture is the death of Jesus Christ. 
we, we read, thou shalt not murder, but yet God ordains the murder of Christ for great good. But let, let's go to the question. I believe in God's sovereign will, which isn't the same as his moral will. No, I don't believe that. Why would God have conflicting wills? They're not conflicting. Absolutely not. Yes, God decrees everything, and we don't understand all of that. His ways are higher than ours. This is different. This is different from his revealed will in Scripture. That's true. I believe in God's simple will, revealed will, moral will, as being part of a complex will of the counsel of his will. There are not, these two do not contradict each other. Well, these last two are the best ones. I'm going to go with that one, yes. Has God before the world, uh, has God before the world began decided, based on unconditional reasons, who's eternally destined will be in heaven and who will go to hell? Yes, clear teaching of scripture. Yes, I believe in double predestination. That's a conversation because there's several different definitions of double predestination. It gets confusing. I usually Calvinists get tagged with double predestination that God ordains everyone to heaven and hell. In one sense, that's true. But the classic Reformed Augustinian understanding is God elects people to salvation, passes over the wicked. Now, is that double predestination or single predestination? And that's where it gets kind of tricky because that word has a couple different definitions. Well, let's go, no, God predestines people unconditionally to heaven, but it's not determined ahead of time that the others will go to hell. That's not true. Yes, God decides those things, but he does not predestine anyone to hell. No, God predestines p people unconditionally. No, I'm going to go with this one. But again, I, I believe in double predestination defined one way, but you can define another way, which is single predestination. But I, I do believe in the end, God ordains people to heaven and hell. But electing people to heaven is different than electing people to hell. God doesn't elect people to hell. God passes over them. So number 16, why should we witness? Because faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. I love non-believers, want them to be saved. And so I want to share the good news with them. Not a bad answer. Because God commands, commands us to. That's a good answer. We witness because God has not only decreed the end, of salvation of some, but also the means to get there. Yeah, absolutely. We should witness out of love and concern for a person's eternal well-being. None of these are bad answers, but I'm going to go with the one that God commands us. Number 17, if God did not decree anything in detail, would he still be in charge? If determinism is not true, I believe in predestination, not determinism, would God, would God will be on the throne? Would God will be would God will be on the throne? Hmm. If God allows things rather than determining them, how he how he still how would he still be God? Wow, I did a poor job reading that. My apologies. I'm trying again. If God did not decree everything in detail, would he still be in charge? Uh, if determinism is not true, would God will be on the would God will be on the throne? I think it's a typo there. If God allows things rather than determining them, would he still be God? Um, yeah, if God doesn't determine all things and he's not sovereign, no, he would not be sovereign if he did not decree all things. I think I'm going with this one. It wouldn't be called determinism. I do not think that part of God's decrees is allowing things, but without God's decrees, he would not be sovereign. Of course, he'd still be God. I'm not going to be that. He would still be God even if he abandoned earth. Yes, he would still be sovereign. The answer is no, he would not be sovereign if he did not decree all things. Now, I mean, if you want to get crazy theoretical, I mean, nah, I'm not going to go down that road. The Bible's very clear. God decrees all things. Number 18, does God love everyone? Yes, but his love for the elect is different from his love for the non-elect. He loves them enough to bless them in this life, but his love in offering, granting salvation is only towards the elect. I like that answer. Yes, but his love for the elect is different from his love for the non-elect. He lovingly offers salvation to all, but those who ultimately reject that offer will be separated from his love forever in hell. Good answer. No. God hates some people. He loves some and hates others. There's some truth to that, too. God loves everyone, even those he hates. He hates the wicked. I was once wicked, and yet I know that he loved me enough to die for me while I was still wicked in my sins. I, you know, there's truth to all these. Um... But Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. I I, I kind of want to say this just to be the curmudgeon, the Calvinist. 
and see what this this quiz will say to me. Um, but I'm gonna go with. Um, I'm gonna go with. One or two. He loves enough people to bless in this life, but his love is. Uh, yeah, I we'll would go with this one. Though I don't mind saying no. How would you define all and the world? All means all, and that all it means. The, the word, the world can mean the physical earth or the people of all the world. Well, cosmos, you know, all the world has different meanings. All means all the people without exception and in context of God's sovereignty, but all people without distinction in the context of who Christ died for. All means different things in different contexts, that's true. The world is in reference to the sovereignty means all people on the world, but means the elect around the world in John 3.16. That's kind of convoluted. Uh, there are 22 definitions of world in the dictionary and six definitions of the Greek word for all in the New Testament. I cannot define them all here, <laughs> okay? All means all with respect to the obvious group being talked about, i.e. all was made by God, all except for God himself, all in the universe. In God so loved the world, the world means every person on earth. I don't like any of these answers. Uh, and going into John 3.16 uh, takes some time. I, I think when it says God loves uh, the world, I would argue the world means the created order. I would argue that the focus should not be in every single human being ever existed, but upon the created, created order. But I'm going to cheek out and go with this one, because the world does mean different things. You have to define it in context. Is God glorified by evil? No, of course not. Yes, all things glorify God. He decreed it. No, but he is glorified in his justice and exploitation of that evil. Um. Yeah, I go with that, because evil is contrary to the nature of God, of course, but God's justice brings forth his glory. Heaven shows his mercy, hell shows his justice. So let's see how we did. We are a, oh, we are 0% Arminian. Yay, you are a Calvinist. I know that. Don't get me wrong here. You are a hardcore Calvinist. I guess I am. You are one of those crawl over broken glass Calvinists. <laughs> Seriously. Be sure to glorify God and all of that you too, okay? Oh, and don't forget loving people. Uh, no, I'm a good Calvinist, so I believe in the law of God. So that was an interesting quiz. It was kind of cheeky. I hope that helps. As always, Christ, grace, and peace to you all. Amen. Hello, Pastor Doug. Back with an addendum to this video. I went through and tried to answer as an Arminian. So I went through the various questions and it actually took me a while and I was trying to get a 100% Arminian score. And I wasn't able to get to 100%. I got to 99% Arminian. And this is what it says. You're a staunch non-Calvinist. Interesting. You know, it's not Arminian. Uh, first, you are, may even be call yourself an Arminian. I love it because, like, you know, we can't have labels. You are very confident about your beliefs and convictions. <laughs> you submit to God's authority and strive to glorify Him. No, you believe that God loves everyone and that the gospel is an offer, uh, is an offer open to all people. May God richly bless you. Uh, this is lame. Now, I have no problem if this person's an Arminian, but if they would be fair, they would put a little warning if you're a hardcore Arminian, if you're 99 plus percent Arminian, you know, give the warning, well, make sure you remember that God is sovereign. You know, we get the Calvinist gets the warning, make sure you love people. Why doesn't the Arminian get the warning, you know, remember that God is actually in control. So obviously the quiz was very biased, which again is fine, but I thought this was interesting, and I thought you'd like to know, because I was curious. Well, as always, again, Christ's grace and peace to everyone. Amen.